Hey, uh, well, kia ora koto. Thank you very, very much for coming out on what would otherwise be a very nice and sunny Saturday afternoon. Um, if you don't already know me from the Wanted posters, I'm Peter Thompson, I'm the chair of the Better Public Media Trust. So I'll be uh, chairing the discussion part of this, uh, this public meeting. I um, want to acknowledge Miles Thomas, our director, for uh, setting this up and organising it. Now, the, the way this is going to work is that uh, I'll, I'll say a couple of words and just mention the, uh, mention the speakers as they, uh, as they speak in turn. But very briefly, we have Stephen Smith from RNZ, Anna Curry from New Zealand On Air, Mark Jennings from Newsroom, uh, Wayne Hope from AUT, uh, Alan Martin, who's also on our trust board, a former uh, uh, CEO of uh, BCNZ, and we'll also have uh, Michael Stiasny, who's the chair of the Ministerial Advisory Group on uh, broadcasting and digital media. So uh, we have a, a stellar lineup. Um, I'll, I'll just open by saying, of course, Better Public Media um, has been uh, campaigning for several years for uh, more investment from the government in uh, public service interest media. We were the Coalition for Better Broadcasting, and the name change reflects the fact that the media ecology has evolved, that it's not only about broadcasting. But I think we'd argue that we're, we're still very much focused on you know, broadcasting as, as, a, as a central component of the media ecology. Uh, the demise of, of television and radio uh, has somewhat been, uh, somewhat been overstated by, by the digital profits, profits and uh, you know, the woes that claim that everything is going to be superseded by on-demand, online, multiple, uh, multiple platform devices. And although that's happening, um, there's still a long way to go before the old TV in the corner of the living room disappears completely. So um, I, I think BPM's view on where things are at at the moment is that in some ways history is rather repeating itself. If you go back to 1999, we had a Labour government coming in with a vision for, of public media after three terms of a national government that hadn't been very sympathetic. Uh, and of course they start to implement plans and immediately uh, have challenges over the budget. So there are perhaps a little bit of history repeating itself insofar as Labour did promise 38 million, only had 15 in the first round. We're of course hoping for more in the future. But there's a big question about whether the points of intervention, the direction of public policy um, in, in the current environment uh, are quite so simple as they were back in 1999. In the multimedia environment with convergence, increased fin financialization, and the massive intensification of competition means that the market is a very, very different sort of animal in, in the 21st century. And so that maybe requires new models of, of public service media. So what kind of models they are and whether they include public television is what we have our panel of experts here to debate today. So uh, the first of our speakers is Stephen Smith. He's the RNZ Head of Audience Strategy is responsible for leading RNZ's thinking and activities around audience research, branding, marketing, product development. He's held a number of roles in the New Zealand media industry. He was uh, head of multi-platform at Māori Television. He was the group head of digital at Fairfax, uh, head of media and entertainment at Vodafone New Zealand, and assistant uh, chief executive and head of content at TVNZ. So uh, please give Stephen a very warm welcome. Welcome to Sunday afternoon. Um, to state the obvious, uh, the media sector is going through a period of great upheaval, upheaval, which is creating significant problems for governments throughout the world as they wrestle with how best to maintain a media ecosystem that keeps people reliably informed, supports democratic engagement, counters misinformation and fake news, and reflects and celebrates the local culture and diversity. While many of the associated problems are beyond the ability of democratic governments to completely control, one of the proven solutions is to ensure that there is at least one well-resourced, non-commercial and independent public broadcaster. The need for this has never been greater than now. In New Zealand, RNZ is the organisation with the core experience and expertise and a strong public media ethos to fulfil this role. Uh, growing the resources available to RNZ uh, will be critical if RNZ is to imp improve and sustain a commercial free role in connecting and informing New Zealanders, providing trusted and accurate news and information 
and exploring and showcasing New Zealand's diverse culture. However, the reaction to investment in RNZ has been that some in commercial media have questioned and lobbied against the value of investing in public media generally and RNZ specifically. And others in publicly owned commercial media have suggested that an answer to their audience and profit decline is that the government should combine its public and commercial media. Of course, we all have financial challenges, but it's not public broadcasting that is hurting commercial media in New Zealand. In fact, in radio, which is arguably the most profitable commercial medium, RNZ has a very strong and symbiotic presence. Making the public broadcaster smaller or weaker won't stop the Googles, the Facebooks of the world, and it won't make New Zealand media companies more profitable. It certainly won't mean better service for, services for New Zealanders, and it won't build the level of trust in and amongst our citizens that all democracies need to thrive. In, an in, in a recent international report on the sector, PricewaterhouseCoopers finds that the major media brands of the future are those that will have the ability to build and sustain consumer trust. Which is why the discussion about public media provided on TV, or for that matter radio or the internet or any other platform, misses the point that to create and sustain trust, what we need to put first and foremost is the public, not the platform. Yes, we will do more and better video content, as we will do more and better audio and written and new media content forms. But the distribution and the channels need to follow, not lead, where the people want and need us to be. OK, thank you very much indeed, Steve. OK, uh, well, on to Anna from New Zealand Air. She's a specialist advisor for screen funding in uh, television and digital. Correct. Um, and is the Hey Hey content uh, funding lead. Uh, if you're not familiar with Hey Hey, I'm sure Anna will explain, but uh, it's a very, very interesting children's initiative. Um, she also assists with policy and strategy reviews and produces New Zealand and Air's uh, annual diversity report. Um, and although she focuses primarily on screen, she also assists across mu uh, music uh, and community broadcasting sectors. Uh, she's also, happy to say, a uh, former tutor and research assistant at Victoria University, where of course I work, and she actually has her MA with distinction in media studies from Victoria. So, big welcome to Anna. Scotland <laughs> Ko Kari Klein Oku Hapu, Ko SS Kai Kura Te Waka, Ko Anna Kari Toku Ema. He kai whakahaere a putia o e mahi ana e te irarangi te motu. Kia ora everyone. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anna Kari and I'm one of the funding advisors at Inveronia. Um, as the focus of this meeting is on whether or not there is a future for public television, I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about New Zealand Oceania's recent changes as a public media funding agency, discuss a recent successful collaboration that's involved us, as well as more collaborations to come. Then I'll end by providing a brief overview of audience research we've published this year um, that reveals interesting trends about how audiences are consuming content in New Zealand, because I believe this is uh, research we should all be paying attention to and trends we should all be paying attention to when we discuss the future of public media. Um, so as many of you will know, in July of last year, NZ On Air launched the NZ Media Fund, which is one single streamlined strategy that replaces our growing number of separate funding strands and strategies that were platform specific. The launch of the NZ Media Fund was a response to changing audience behaviour <coughs> and an acknowledgement that audiences are fragmenting and consuming content on a multitude of platforms. Before the launch of the NZ Media Fund, our 20-strong agency was quite siloed. We had different teams looking after television, digital and radio, which made sense in an analogue world, but as um, those terms, television, digital and radio, are becoming harder to define, um, it, was, it was making it very difficult to keep those separate. Um, so the NZ Media Fund is a simplified funding strategy that has four funding streams, scripted, factual, music and platforms. In factual and scripted streams, in those we will consider uh, anything for television, online or radio, or a combination of those, which we do really encourage. Um, NZ On Air takes a platform neutral approach and encourages multi-platform collaboration where possible because it means that content can reach a large, large audience wherever they are consuming content. I would like to talk about Hey Hey for a minute. 
So uh, this is TVNZ and NZ on Air's joint venture, ad-free online platform for New Zealand tamariki that champions local content. Hey Hey was born out of an understanding of changing audience behaviour, uh, just like the NZ Media Fund was. So as an agency, we were increasingly discomforted at uh, spending a significant amount of money on ephemeral content, so children's content that was being broadcast maybe once on linear television and very likely not being seen again. So we knew we needed to be funding multi-purpose content. Audience research supported this view. We're continually commissioning research and undertaking uh, projects ourselves to ensure that our funding strategies reflect audience behaviour. So um, in the 2015 Children's Media Use Study, uh, it revealed something quite interesting, and bear in mind this research is over three years old now, but it showed that uh, YouTube had overtaken TV2 as the most popular media source for New Zealand children aged 6 to 14. Um, each day YouTube reached 35% of New Zealand children back in 2015 and TV2 was reaching 32%. It is important to mention that TV was still a consistent presence, uh, reaching 9 out of 10 6 to 14 year olds each day, but tablets and smartphones had very quickly become part of many children's daily lives and the uptake of these devices changed the media that children were consuming. So we knew it was time for a change. In 2015, we um, started a review which involved um, a discussion paper, um, published submissions, publishing submissions to those um, discussion papers which kick-started an industry corridor. We put out an RFP to see who would maybe want to partner with us with an online platform for kids. And finally, as a result of that whole process and a lot of amazing mahi from a lot of people, um, in May of this year, Hey Hey launched. And again, that is a joint venture from NZ On Air and TVNZ. It's an ad-free local content platform for New Zealand children with a strong focus on local content that is available on desktop, tablet and phone and coming very soon to Chromecast. So Hey Hey is a living, breathing, recent example of how NZ On Air adapts its funding in order to remain relevant for local audiences. It's also an excellent example, in my biased opinion, of a successful industry collaboration that delivers public media content to young New Zealanders who are at a crucial age of developing their sense of self and their cultural identity, for whom local content is vitally important. Um, now I'll talk um, about NZ On Air's um, recent audience research, because um, I believe that the results of our 2018 Where Are the Audience uh, research provides an important context when questioning whether there's a future for public television. Um, so the full report is available on NZ On Air's website, so if you're interested in the detail, please go and find that. Um, but I will try to go over the key findings without bombarding you with too many percentages and other statistics. So this was the third Where Are the Audiences research um, study that we have published, um, which Glasshouse Glass Consulting has produced for us. Um, so they've produced that every two years since 2014. So we now have three reports uh, spread two years apart um, that span four years of rapid media change. This year's report shows that traditional media, so by that I mean te linear television and live radio, continue to reach the biggest audiences. Linear television reaches 82% of New Zealanders each week, while broadcast radio 78. But on a daily basis, the audiences of total linear television and broadcast radio continue to, to decline over time. The ongoing decline of the daily reach of linear TV is interestingly driven by a decline in Sky TV viewing and of viewing linear TV on a pay TV platform. Sky Movies channels show the biggest decline since 2016, which may not be a surprise, whereas Sky Sport channels are more stable. It is important to reiterate that that decline in, li in total linear television is driven by pay TV because linear TV on a free-to-air platform actually showed a 9% increase in this year's report. Um, the weekly reach of SVOD, subscription video on demand, Netflix, Lightbox, uh, has nearly doubled since 2016. Uh, it now reaches more than 6 in 10 people weekly. Uh, New Zealand Netflix now reaches 27% of New Zealanders each day. That's up from 14% in 2016. So what does all this mean? Uh, traditional media forms still reach the largest audiences, but there continues to be an increased use of online media forms. The reach of linear TV and live radio audiences continues a pattern of decline, but the rate of change has slowed since 2016, and the weekly reach of linear TV on a free-to-air platform has actually increased this year. So there is a slowing growth um, of online media, and it's important to note that there have been fewer developments in the last two years that would help maintain the previous rate of change. So in the period of the last report, 2014-16, 
We had the launch of Netflix, Lightbox, Neon in New Zealand, NZME's Watch Me, Apple Music. There just haven't been that many developments in this 2016-18 uh, period for the latest report. Um, just quickly, another important audience metric to consider is time spent viewing. Time spent viewing means exactly what it says, that the amount of time a user spends, it's, amount, it's an amount of time the user spends viewing that media. So our 2018 research shows that New Zealanders continue to, de to dedicate the most time each day to traditional broadcast media by a considerable margin, and this has declined very little over time. While time spent viewing online media continues to grow rapidly, it's got a long way to go before it reaches the time that we're spending on traditional TV. So New Zealanders each day spend two and a half hours watching linear television, uh, one and a half hours listening to radio, compared to 62 minutes on SVOD, subscription video on demand. That's the online media to which users dedicate um, the most time. So the ongoing pattern of declining reach but stable time spent viewing of linear television and live radio suggests that it's the lighter viewers and listeners who continue to drop out of daily audiences of traditional media, but that they're maintaining a really loyal um, audience base as well. Um, and finally, in terms of this audience research, it feels important to acknowledge that there is a notable generational divide within these results. The generation gap remains strong and behaviour differs strongly between those over and under about 45 um, years old. So above this age, traditional media dominates and below online media is more popular, which is not a surprise. But this year's report shows that that generational gap is closing and we can kind of look at, at, as to why. So the closing of the generational gap is due to older New Zealanders adopting online technology. There is now a bigger generational gap between um, in consuming linear TV, magazines and newspapers as more younger New Zealanders stop using those media each day. Um, but older New Zealanders, those aged 45 and more, have increased their use of daily online video, music streaming, SVOD on demand on online radio. So in other words, the profile of online media users is, has broadened since 2016, um, while traditional media audiences continue to get older. Other factors do play a role in media consumption, such as access to technology, ethnicity, region, socioeconomic level, but our research showed that none of these factors played as much of a role as age did. Okay, so what does all this mean for NZ On Air and our funding strategy? It confirms that launching the NZ Media Fund was the correct approach. While there is a temptation to have 40 different buckets of funding for all these niche needs, it doesn't make sense. In a complicated, fast-changing uh, media environment, you need a simple and flexible approach. NZ On Air has a strong strategy in how we invest in public media content, but it is a strategy that is flexible enough to adapt to industry changes as they come. Yamaki Nui, Tenakote Kato. Thank you very much, Anna. Okay, so next up we have uh, Mark Jennings. Um, um, Mark's had a very long, distinguished career in journalism, um, primarily in broadcasting. Um, he had 10 years in uh, television journalism in Australia, and then in 1989 he came to New Zealand and he was with Media Works for what, 27 years, which is quite a stint. Um, during that time, he mentored successive generations of uh, acclaimed and well-known journalists, and he was responsible for also for launching News Hub across television, uh, across TV3 and Radio Live. So Mark's work is now at Newsroom, uh, focuses on media industry, business, and the tertiary sector, and he's the Newsroom co-editor. So please give Mark a very warm welcome. Uh, thanks, Peter, over and <clears throat> just like to acknowledge uh, some of the other very good journalists sitting in the room, Robert, Barry, George, um, who some of you won't know, but very well known uh, to me over my career. Um, I, I guess I'm different from uh, people here. I'm not actively involved in the public sector um, uh, in any way, but uh, and my remarks, I guess, are mainly observations uh, as opposed to um, knowing what's really happening. But, I've recently interviewed both the two CEOs of our uh, major public broadcasters, uh, Kevin Kenrick um, and Paul Thompson, and I think it's really interesting to talk to those two because I think we've got something different happening in New Zealand now, and these two have a, a much bigger focus on the whole media, and I kind of probably like to widen this out a little bit and talk about the whole media. I think Thompson, through his um, background at Fairfax, 
um, and he recently came back where he, where he obviously uh, faced all the commercial pressures um, that that organisation um, is under. And he recently came back from uh, Seoul at a public broadcasters conference, which Stephen will obviously um, be aware of. But um, during my interview with him, he, he said something which I now reflect back on, which I think was more interesting than the stuff I, I, I kind of reported. Um, but he said that he would not expose RNZ to the risks of linear TV. And I think that's a very telling statement because I slightly disagree with Anna, although I don't want to disagree with her too much in case we want some funding. But um, I, I don't totally believe that survey. Uh, I think linear TV is declining quite quickly, and I think we'll get to a point where we'll go over a cliff and, and um, decline very quickly. And I think Thompson knows that, and I think because he talked to the BBC, um, the CBC and the ABC, obviously when he was over there, who are all getting knocked around um, at the moment on television. RNZ, of course, is, is different. It doesn't, up until very recently, um, have any uh, television arm. And my personal view is, it, I agree with Thompson, he'd be well advised to stay away from it. it it's, it's a very tough and um, precarious business, I, I think, at the moment. Um, Kenrick, of course, is um, he, he's running the only profitable uh, TV network um, in the country. But I think he, he and, but we'll, and we'll just expand on that for a second, um, MediaWorks hasn't made any money out of TV for a long, long time. Um, my understanding is that they haven't quite a good year this year and they're probably going to get close to break even. But I, I don't think they're ever going to do better than that, and I think they will probably end up doing worse than that. Prime, as we know, loses money, but it's supported by Sky. MediaWorks TV, TV, of course, is supported by its radio arm. If it didn't have radio, it would have been out of business absolutely long time ago. Choice, small player, I don't know much about it. Irene might know a little bit more than me about it, but probably being supported by, I think it's Canadian owners. Um, the news divisions, and I think this is um, where it gets really interesting. I think probably both of the big news divisions, TVNZ News and um, 3 News, News Hub, uh, well, News Hub will certainly be not profitable. That news division will be losing money. Um, obviously, I have some inside knowledge because I ran it for a long time, and um, given its audience levels where it is now, it has to be uh, basically losing money. I think TVNZ's news will also probably be close to losing money because the 6pm audiences have declined. And of course 6pm is and has been the, the powerhouse of television news. But these, these programs are now in trouble. TVNZ's not quite as much because it's benefited from a very strong uh, lead in the program and it could still possibly be profitable. But I think Kevin Kendrick is thinking forward and when he's when we had this discussion the other day um, about a possible merger or combining, I actually think he's not so much thinking of the whole necessarily, but I suspect he's thinking a bit about the news area, um, where at some point he's going to have to do something about the costs of news. Um, if, if MediaWorks is sold as it is likely to be, or I mean its owners desperately want it to be sold, if it is, then there could be a real, real problem for the um, news, um, MediaWorks News, because a new owner it will only be buying it for its radio assets. It won't be buying it for the TV assets. <coughs> so all the news division sits within television and relies on um, six, the 6 p.m. bulletin pretty much for revenue. So I think the new owner may well say, right, we're, we're closing television or we're getting out of news. And that's going to be really interesting because radio, um, commercial radio, if you look at media works, is mainly music radio. They're only going to want a headline news service. I don't think Radio Live will probably survive much longer. It's, um, it's just been um, a money drain, really. It has made no progress against ZB or Radio New Zealand, and actually it won't. Um, so a new owner would probably close that immediately. So the need for a news service out, out of radio, um, they could go and buy it off NZME um, or Radio New Zealand or whatever. So I think we could see 
MediaWorks News um, just disappeared, um, which would be quite a dramatic um, development in this country. And I think Thompson and I think Kenrick both know these things. So they, I think, want to start a wider conversation in this country about the whole media and its health. Thompson um, has, has been very interesting in his sharing of content um, throughout other media. I think it started off as a brand extension for Radio New Zealand and a smart move. Now I think he probably thinks it's actually an important part of the ecosystem and a way he can help um, uh, both the commercial sector and other parts of, and, and TVNZ uh, as, as well. Um, but there's a, a bit of a, a problem with that in my view, is we again um, stopping the diversity. Um, while I think it's, it's good and I um, think that the standard of news coming out of RNZ is, is high quality, um, it is just um, compressing uh, the number of opinions and sources, if you like, uh, in this country. But it, it, it's still a good thing. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that TVNZ, which, which was, when I look back on it, was a real pity, is that the, the ZB news arm uh, did not go to TVNZ, but it's gone to NZB. Because I think if TVNZ had a radio arm, then it would be able to look forward and say, we're going to be in the news business here for a, a significant period of time. Um, because as I think um, who was mentioning the PwC report, um, radio, it, it looks out five years, and radio is the only form of traditional media that actually grows in that five years. Um, TV declines from 18.5% of the market to 13.5%. Um, that, that is a dramatic decline, and it's, it's why I think TV is in a lot more trouble than perhaps people think it is. Um, but radio uh, is actually increasing its share slightly um, in this period, which is no mean feat. So if we had, if TVNZ actually had the ZB radio arm, I think it would be in quite good shape. Anyway, this is, this is sort of a bit of a rambling spiel of mine, but the, the next thing, of course, is where does the government sit in this? Where does Chris Farfoy sit in this? And perhaps Michael will tell us um, uh, uh, later on, but um, I, I think he's got some major issues to think about. He's got, um, he's got Radio New Zealand, which has performed, in my view, well. Um, it's survived nine years of national, and really did remarkably well in that period of time. Um, now it, the purse strings have been loosened up a bit and it's going to get some more money, well overdue, and I think it will make really good use of that money because it's a very lean, um, focused organisation now. So that will be, in my view, high quality spending that the government puts into that. is going to have to think about what happens with TVNZ. Um, at the moment, it's okay. But I think in the next five years we'll see that decline. Um, that, com that company declined quite significantly. And then he's got to worry about um, all the other media. Now, obviously, there is, in my view, a solution here. And again, I'll be very interested to hear Michael and view on this. But if the government does not move to tax Facebook and Google, it's got to, we've got a big, big problem. I mean, finally, some of the European uh, countries are actually waking up and put a 2% revenue tax on it. The politicians in this country are just too gutless. They're just too wimpy all round. This, this issue needs to be tackled, should be tackled, and we should take this money and put it into the media here, otherwise we're not going to have a media. Well, yes, we'll have Radio New Zealand, but we might not have too much else if we don't do something about it. What would you do if you got the money then? This is, now this is the interesting question where Anna comes in and Michael comes in. Does it go, does it go into NZ on air and get distributed? I think there's some issues around that. And that is that I think NZ on air is very good at project-based funding. It will fund, say, investigative journalism. It will fund some multimedia journalism. It will fund some other series. And, and they will be good. 
but that doesn't address the really core problem we've got here of general news coverage. Um, there's no funding for baseline coverage of news, and that's what is basically disappearing in this country. It's the reason why newsroom, why we went into business, because we could see all these areas um, that get no coverage. Our journalists turn up on stories all the time. There's no other journalists here. They're, they're gone. Um, these days, um, I mean, there are so many stories out there, and you, you've got them on your own. There's no one else covering half of this, because the number of journalists in this country has declined by 60% um, in, in the last 10 years. So, you know, um, there's, a, there's a big issue. What I'd like to see the government do is tackle Facebook and Google, and then look at a way to increase the baseline uh, economic health of the media. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed to Mark. Um, so, following on, uh, we're going to turn to uh, Professor Wayne Hope from AUT. Wayne's a very well-known uh, media researcher with specialisms in uh, New Zealand political and media history. Um, He's also the author of a major book called Time, Communication and Global Capitalism, which I recommend if you have a rainy day. Um, Wayne's the, uh, the curriculum leader for undergraduate uh, media communication courses at AUT, and he's the uh, joint editor of uh, an online uh, journal that's run through the International Association of Media and Communication Researchers. Um, you may well have come across him because he's a regular media commentator who's appeared or spoken on a number of... Uh, uh, broadcast programs such as TVNZ Breakfast, Face TV, Radio Live, Radio National, 9 to Noon and so on. And he contributes regular commentary pieces for the Daily Blog. So a big welcome to Wayne. Thank you Peter for that kind introduction. Um, much of what I wanted to say, or some of what I wanted to say, has been uh, well covered by the other speakers, especially the last point about Google and Facebook. Um, I'm going to start with an advertisement. Uh, <clears throat> apart from what Peter said, I'm also co-director of, um, <coughs> um, of a, um, a media research organisation called Journalism, Media and Democracy. Every year we put out a media ownership report for New Zealand and that includes sections on public media. And we've been doing that since 2011 and they're all online and this year's report is going to be released on December the 6th uh, and if you want any more details, see me, I'll send you an email. The reason, <coughs> the reason I'm mentioning all of this is because some of my comments today are going to be to do with some latest developments in, uh, with regard to public radio, with regard to TVNZ, just to see how the numbers look and so on. If we look at things as a trend in New Zealand since we started doing these reports about 2011, uh, what's been happening is a growing concentration of ownership in commercial media and within those structures of concentration, a growing dependence on banks and private equity companies to actually run the media. And what that means is, is that these kinds of owners um, don't have an inherent interest in developing news, current affairs, and the culture of journalism and advancing the public sphere. So therefore, um, public media has always been up against the eight ball because of that overall secular ownership trend. Um, if we look at the television market and bring ourselves into this year and maybe the year before, um, this is what I see happening, and I'll talk about TVNZ a little bit after that. Um, first of all, the impact of social media is really important, not just because it's taking eyeballs away from 6 o'clock, but also because people are starting to use Facebook as their primary news source. And that was a major contributing factor to what happened in the US 2016 election. Facebook news feeds don't have, how can I put it, they don't have a reliable track record and they don't, they come in so fast it's hard to verify what the headlines are actually saying and that kind of pollutes the public sphere in a way compared to project funding uh, from New Zealand on air to help journalists and journalist culture and so on. That's world apart from a growing dependence on Facebook um, as, a, as a news source. We've also seen of course uh, the rise and spread of video streaming networks of which Netflix is the most significant. What we've also seen um, um, over the last few years, but it's particularly significant this year, is the decline in pay television, or to put it another way, the decline in Sky. Now Murdoch used to have a, a, a significant share of Sky until about three years ago, and then he pulled out because he knew the business model was going to falter. 
um, the News Corp guys are pretty shrewd in their projections. So, News so Sky became owned by financial um, enterprises, by banks and so on, um, and it's struggling. Um, two big things happened this year. Um, it lost, it hasn't lost, but it's been sort of sidelined um, by the deal between TVNZ uh, and Spark and the Rugby World Cup coverage. And in the projection ahead for the America's Cup, uh, that's a TVNZ Spark arrangement by the looks of it at this stage. So Sky's struggling a little bit. Um, so what about TVNZ itself? <coughs> well, this year's total revenue is 319 million, approximately the same as the previous year, so that's fairly solid. Uh, the two news sites that they have, um, TVNZ, CoNZ and One News Now, uh, made an almost 60% increase um, in revenue compared to the year before. Um, and as I said, TVNZ is actually uh, investing long term in these sport arrangements with Spark. So it actually, there's a bit of revenue there. And it's just a matter of using some of that to reinvest um, into a public media or a public television initiative. So the question is, what should that be? And so I'm just going to take a stab. I think that we ought to revisit the TVN6, TVN7 channels that we had under the previous Labor government. Maybe not two, just the one. But this time, um, that particular channel would also have uh, locked into it um, some video streaming coming through it and also an internet presence. So in other words, it's, it's TVNZ7+. Plus. Because one of the key things about television media now, it's not either or, it's not like television's going down the plug hole um, and we're going to get lots of new media. Uh, what it is is a remediation. And TVNZ, I think, in a commercial sense, has done quite a good job of, of actually um, dealing with this. As I said, their revenue is higher this year as it was last year. Uh, I think we might need to have another look at dividends going to Treasury and how much that should be. There should be some logic of reinvestment. I think the big problem the last government made, uh, before the key government, is that they didn't have any legal protection or legislative underpinning for the TVN6 and TV 7 initiatives. So any kind of initiative along those lines, with an internet presence and a video streaming presence, needs to be uh, legally anchored. Otherwise, when there's a next change of government, it'll just be pushed out again and you get this endless pendulum that we have in New Zealand politics. Uh, I think we could do a little bit more with the parliamentary channel. Uh, and extend that a little bit, extend its hours. Um, depends what kind of remit you want. Uh, depends whether you want to make it mainly news and current affairs or if you want to do other stuff. But there's definitely opportunities there and there always has been. So that's, I'll just leave that in the air for TVNZ. Um, if we go to radio, um, it's pretty clear from this year's figures that actually Radio New Zealand's performing pretty well. But before I get to that, I think we need some joined up section, some joined up thinking uh, in the radio sector from a public media perspective. I don't think using um, RNZ as a vehicle for, for a television channel initiative was really ever going to work. Uh, there were insufficient funds to start with and it's always been pushed further and further out into the future and with the turmoil over the um, broadcasting ministership per se, the chances of it coming in, in this term of government are very low indeed. Um, and I think we should have a different set of priorities. And the priorities I'm talking about are joined up thinking. So, in other words, what I'd like to see is Radio New Zealand develop as it is, but I'd like to see more linkages between Radio New Zealand um, and the access radio stations. Uh, a colleague of mine um, in the Communication Studies Department, Dr Matt Mulgaard, has just completed a major 25,000 word study for New Zealand on air doing a, basically an overview of all the access stations, how much funding they get, what audiences they get, what remits they have and how they're doing. Um, and Matt was saying that there's really clear opportunities here for a complementarity between access radio on the one hand and TVNZ on, and Radio New Zealand on the other. Radio New Zealand seems to be a little bit more top down, whereas access is more local. So you've got this sense of localism. And it's this sense of localism which we're losing in our overall media ecology. Um, there's no question about that, and I think this is the way where we could actually push the envelope uh, back a little bit. I think there also needs to be some complementarity uh, with the EWI radio network. So what I mean by these complementarities is integrated funding, um, perhaps sharing operational facilities. My understanding is that that would certainly be possible with Radio New Zealand and some of the access radio, uh, radio facilities. But also philosophically, 
And we need to put forward principles of a public sphere which handles things at the state -led level but also handles things at the local level. And we need a set of philosophies or principles uh, which would hold this joined up thinking about radio together. Uh, and I think that's where we should be going. So I'll just leave it there because I really agreed with a lot of what the other speakers were saying as well. So our uh, penultimate speaker is uh, Alan Martin, OBE. Um, Alan, of course, has recently joined us on the, the uh, BPM board. He's a hugely experienced broadcaster. He works as a TV executive on both sides of the Tasman. Um, but he has his roots in program making. He began uh, making TV in uh, England in the early 1960s. And coming back to New Zealand, he uh, developed influential programs for the NZBC in Compass and Town and Around. Uh, then went to the ABC in Australia and returned to New Zealand uh, in the mid-1970s to set up the new second channel. And he later became Director General of TVNZ. So bringing wealth of experience, please welcome Alan Martin. Well, an antiquated and perhaps simplistic view of the situation. Um, but, as we all know, there is an argument which suggests that the spread of media outlets via the internet will meet the objectives of public service, public service television. That this diversity will fulfil the aims of public service media, but it won't. Fragmentation of the means of communication is more likely to result in smaller groups of being supplied with information they already endorse. Only a national service which has the capacity to maintain a range of programs and ideas to attract people to watch, read or listen to that particular service will be able to achieve the aims of public service media. Maintaining a variety of high standard programming is a requirement for a public service channel to be meaningful. Something an independent media group would be not willing to undertake in the long term without commercial support. Consistency in output, whether international or local, can only be achieved by an organisation with the facilities and preferably much of the staff operating on a full-time basis. If you want to give society full expression to the state of affairs within it and the conditions and existing at that time and the possibilities of change, and the possibilities of the alternatives, you must have an authoritative and commercial free voice. Preferably maintaining a quality of output at a price which can be justified to the public. But you cannot suddenly arrive at a fully developed public TV service. It takes time to recruit, to, to, to train if necessary, a like-minded core of professional people working within that culture with similar ideals. You need people who have ideas, people who care, who have a passion for what they are doing, and who understand what can be achieved within society, the, the conditions prevailing in society at the time, and their responsibilities as a broadcaster. And people of that, I'm delighted to see today two of those people who in the past have achieved uh, that situation, namely Bob Ellis and maybe more, and, and George Andrews here in documents. Now George is a lovely example, a prime example of the situation I'm talking about. Uh, in that um, working in a public uh, interest television at the time, 40 years ago, he had the idea that the public need to, needed to know um, that the price of progress came at a cost to the, to the landscape. He worked on this idea and he produced a series of programs called Landmark, as I remember, with Professor Cumberland. And it was very successful. It was, in fact, I think, the genesis of the 
understanding we have today of the need to protect the landscape. And it probably was the forerunner of many of those controls and restrictions that we have on the landscape today. Um, and, and the number of prime, um, protest groups that we arise very quickly to protest the landscape. So thank you, George. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> So uh, I diverting that. But anyway, to resolve the present situation, well, the Broadcasting Act has been changed many times, uh, over 20, I think it's about 25 to date. That's the Act itself, with over, over 100 amendments, and sometimes quite rapidly and without difficulty. So it should be relatively quick and easy a um, decision, in my view, to make one of the TVNZ channels, a standalone commercial company with the profits not going back into the public service, the general fund, but to support uh, the other public service channel and public service radio. Piecemeal funding through a filtering organisation like New Zealand On Air will not work. So if it's generally accepted that broadcasting should be a matter of information, enlightenment, uh, education, if you will, and entertainment, um, then <laughs> we will know. In the long term, a commercial free public service channel would need to be given time to develop, ideally seeking economies of scale and initially with limited local content. And it would be essential to maintain that local contact uh, very, very successfully. The first programs would need to be successful because of the media focus, because of uh, government expectations, and the need to engender public support from the beginning. That is to grow from small triumphs and ensure public support and public awareness of the benefits. But it could start with some advantages, such as Country Calendar and Fair Go and other examples which have endured. However, these ideals would require the backing of an enlightened public administration, which accepted the need to provide society with a public service system. But governments are rarely that proactive and it will take much pressure on them and for them to legislate a commercial free environment with a pursuit of fact beyond the five second news soundbite would and the exploration of ideas I might say would undoubtedly benefit the individual, the community and our society. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much to Alan. Uh, now our, our final speaker is actually a special guest. Um, so uh, very privileged to have uh, uh, two members of the government's ministerial advisory group with us. We have both Irene Gardner and the chair of that group, uh, Michael Stiasny. So uh, Michael, would you care to say a few words? Would you like to come to the front? Um, so I'll give you okay. a few personal uh, comments because it's inappropriate um, to give you anything else. Um, and. Uh, I guess we came to observe so uh, on a Sunday afternoon, so this is slightly different. Um, the first thing is we're all a little bit unsure about what the new minister um, is up to. Um, I think we all thought that we would be uh, replaced or terminated or whatever. Um, we're still in existence and we do have some uh, new terms of reference as of last week. Um, so our role um, specifically now is to assist and um, comment, recommend, I think, on the um, budgets of RNZ and NZ on air. Um, I think previously under Minister Curran it was more to um, resolve, so um, we're giving advice. Um, so that's quite good. Um, my discussions with the Minister I think we should all feel um, 
happy or um, yeah, slightly more relaxed that he does, under, well, from his own pretty personal experience, he does understand the situation and I think he has a sympathy for the issues. Um, whether that manifests itself in a good outcome is about Parliament and uh, Cabinet engagement rather than anything else. But he is, uh, I think, supportive. Um, so I think there are two big issues that Mark probably discussed more than anyone else. The first one is that we have an issue and a distinction between commercial and non-commercial. Um, we have Fairfax, NZME, and we have um, MediaWorks and Sky, all with their own issues. And they've all been trying to play around with solutions. Um, they haven't paid me to um, advise them on their solutions, but none of them have worked to date. And uh, as they wouldn't have got my support, I feel quite good about it. Um, but it's quite clear that they have, they're struggling to find solutions to survive successfully in this environment. Um, so that's over there. Sorry, I ramble around a bit. We have a regulatory framework over here called the Commerce Commission, which has stepped into Fairfax and NZME and would probably step into any other um, engagement and would stop it. Now, in a short-term environment, stopping the NZME Fairfax merger would appear to be a very good idea. But if we look out to 5, 10, 15 years, the issues that we should all be thinking about is that there isn't enough money in a population of 4 million people to run media to a level that we all want. And that's the fundamental issue. It's only going to get worse. I mean, let's be honest, Netflix makes a TV program significantly um, no, it doesn't make it cheaper, but it can sell it to a wider audience than we can, so therefore it can pump um, product down the tube a lot easier than we can in New Zealand outwards. So we have a problem, and whether that's news or whether it's programming, it is going to become more and more common that our children will be listening to American accents or whatever far more frequently than they are already. Um, and they are already anyway, so um, it's a big issue. So from where I sit on a personal level, Fairfax NZME, for instance, a merger to hold them together for a short period of time while they're dying is a lot better than having them die. And you hope that something will eventuate to keep them alive, albeit that is remote, I think. So that's your landscape. If that's your landscape, um, there can be no doubt that keeping public media um, funded is really, really critical for survival. The biggest issue is that when you're sitting in Cabinet, um, they have not only media to, public media to deal with, they have 101 other things to deal with. And we know that there is not enough money in the system to fund everything. So you have to accept that, you know, we're a... a pimple on the bum, so to speak. We might be more important than some other things, but you have to sell that message to cabinet, to government, and to the public. And today, I don't think you have. Um, so the number one issue, does the man, you know, the, the man or woman on the Clapham omnibus understand the seriousness of the debate we should be having? And I don't think they do. And until they do, there's not enough noise about this issue. There are you <laughs> and a few other people, um, not, a, not, not a lot else. So um, I think we should all acknowledge Claire Curran's contribution. She actually had the right idea, a whole lot of other issues got in the way, but public media is so critical to New Zealand's um, fabric and society that something needs to be done. But the big issue is there isn't an awareness of the real issue outside of the public. So number one, I think that's what you should be doing. Number two, um, because there isn't enough money and there is too much to, not enough to share around, we come to the real big conflict. The conflict between plurality and survival. Where I sit is, we won't achieve both. So to me, what is happening now with um, Kevin Kendrick 
Um, what we tried to achieve with the new funding between New Zealand On Air and Radio New Zealand is about sharing the resource both asset-wise and um, people-wise inside public media to squeeze the best outcomes we can with as little as we have. Um, and so the work that's being done by two gentlemen whose names are Sean yeah, um, is about how much is available from an asset base around collaboration. Um, I think, unfortunately, we're going to be surprised there isn't that much around. But sharing of assets creates a culture of sharing ideas and working together to get the best outcome. So hopefully it will lead into the second. Um, and that's unfortunately the best we can do. There's a whole other discussion about Maori TV and um, the necessity of how we're going to get um, an, an increase in the uh, of the funding with the outcomes around Te Reo, um, Pacific languages are in a worse state than Te Reo. We haven't even got to that because whilst we're a diverse population, we seem to be a uh, Maori and um, European debate, but it should actually be about a much wider group of language survivors. So, how's that for a Okay, well thank you very much indeed to all our speakers. Um, so we'll open the floor up to questions. Miles, did you want to interject with uh, uh, no, any no, actions? No, no, no. If, if, if things go quite well, I'll some of these questions over here. Right, yeah. Um, so, but if anyone has a question, fire away. Uh, David at the front and we'll move around. Um, I do have a question here. I'm going to get to it. And I could put it up front as well, but I also want to speak for a minute or so with it. Um, so the question, I'll put it up front, is whether to tinker or whether to um, go with some radical change. Um, Paul went back to 1999, and it was nice to hear going back to um, about 40 years. Um, the landscape we currently have in New Zealand for broadcasting is the one that was put in place 30 years ago when we established a system which was for television, uh, across the board commercial, with a separate uh, independent, editorial independent funding agency. And um, from my point of view, over the past 30 years, the best thing we've had going for public media has been New Zealand on air. So whatever we do, I don't think we should throw out the baby with the bathroom. Um, but I also personally don't think we should just tinker. Um, just a personal reflection, uh, overnight, I don't know if anyone in this room knew him, um, a producer called Phil Shingler, Shingler died overnight. Um, Phil with Alistair Barry, who's a New Zealand filmmaker, made what was potentially, a, I think it was a pioneering and possibly the first, I don't know, New Zealand uh, UK co-production, um, which was Nuclear Free Pacific. It was made in 1988, just before the changes. Um, uh, well, Phil is no longer with us. Alistair has been making um, really important documentaries, but on the bones of his bum, um, and, and not supported by the commercial media um, structures. And Ruth Harley, who was the other key person in that, because she was the TVNZ, uh, I think, commissioner who made it happen. Ruth Harley went up and set up New Zealand on air, and um, is now its chair. She was the initial director, and, and she's now its chair. Now, some major change took place. Um, I think a major change that went with that is with the conceptual one of thinking of viewers as consumers rather than citizens. I think we should arguably revisit that. Um, and um, and I liked, I'm interested in what was being talked about in terms of uh, a relationship potentially with access media um, because there is something in that because participatory trends are the opportunity, and I've been banging this drum for some time, for public media. Um, 
uh, where, where content is coming from, excuse me, from the citizenry as much as for the citizenry. I think the big question, you know, yes, levies. I think we do need to grapple with that. So, I mean, you know, a lot of what's been said. I think you've got four options. You've got the TVNZ seven, six, seven option, which was great, but it was tinkering. Um, you've got the potential of RNZ to become more pluralistic, pluralistic with its voices, through, with more participation, and, and with sufficient in investment to also be able to do the blue chip stuff, the documentaries that cost $500,000 and really go somewhere as single one-off documentaries. That doesn't happen just by financial tinkering which is what's been taking place, I'm almost finished. Or you've got, do we try and do something with TV1, which has been our most traditionally identified public broadcaster, and I know there's at least one view in this room that thinks that's, what, that's where we should go. Or option four, do we do something else altogether? Now I think those are the four options, but what they all need to be do, I believe, is not just tinker, that we need to go back 1988-89 and go, look what happened then, now we don't want to go back there, the world has been pointed out has changed, we need to go forward, but do we just tinker or do we get radical? They got radical then. <laughs> Thank you David. Don't you have to establish how you can do, even if everyone agrees to do what you suggest, isn't it almost impossible to achieve in this current Environment. That's the one thing we've learned. Why is that? How do you, how do you feel it? Because to get radical change, which is what you prefer, you need to have an environment that is accepting of radical change. <coughs> Currently, I think we'd say, would we, that from what we've seen, that is not the platform you were in. You, you had. We didn't in 1988 or not. Fine, so then your discussion is about how do you create the environment to achieve dramatic change. Mm. In terms of funding, there's absolutely no doubt, uh, from a practical point of view, that you could tax Google and Facebook. The obstacles are not economic, they're political. But it's important to distinguish those two words because um, you've got to have a vision for how things could be properly funded uh, with good examples, um, rather than say, oh no, this is not operable because the economics won't work. That's actually not, not the case at all. Uh, the economics would work. I mean, look at how much tax they don't actually pay. Uh, their business model is premised on having a very tiny number of workers to pay uh, and just cannibalising commodifying content. So they can, they can be taxed without much, without much Danger of them falling over or anything like that. It's just the political obstacle. No, that's not fair. You're mixing metaphors. Um, the first issue is whether we should tax Google or Facebook, and I actually agree we should, but you have to create an environment. So the first debate is around the fact that big corporates aren't paying enough tax. The second one is you then go and tax them, but then there's an exceptionally large leap from taxing corporates to put the money in the kitty to give it to you only. And that again comes back to the same issue. Why would we give it to this part of society when there's a whole lot of other people who need it more or less? So, a whole lot of steps in what you've suggested. The, the argument would be that it's Facebook and Google are undermining the business models of mainstream media. But the, the fundamental is that they are not paying their fair share of burden to keep New Zealand society alive. I, 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 think, I think there's two separate issues here. They're, they're, they're related, but they're separate. Issue one is whether or not Google should pay tax along with McDonald's. Yeah. Yeah, and, and if that tax goes into the consolidated fund, well, isn't that just part of business taxation in general? Something Better Public Media Trust did put forward, it wasn't our only idea, but it was an idea um, whilst National was in, in power because they wanted a fiscally neutral option for funding was a marginal levy on a very, very wide range of media. And what we suggested is if you put maybe half a percent, you know, a tax across a very, very 
wide range of media, including subscription media that would now cover Netflix and, uh, and Lightbox. If you also included you, potentially advertising, although that's problematic in the current environment with the type, type market, uh, internet service pr providers, uh, telecommunications tax. I mean, there already is a levy on the the, uh, uh, the broadband development fund, so that that already exists actually, and it's due to run out soon. So you could continue that. And the other idea was to put a very small tax on retail products, that all, all the hardware that, uh, that consumers use to access all these new media products. So, for example, if you go and buy a you know, $1,000 television, um, maybe $10 of that or $5 of that goes into the pot. So it's treating the media ecology as a whole and making sure that the, the businesses that, that profit the greatest from that media ecology contribute to offsetting the market the failures that their commercial activities tax. tend to produce. In the same way as regional fuel tax. <laughs> a bit like a regional fuel tax, if you will. Well, across the board, yeah. it's not. I so there's, I think there's two issues there. Sorry, Mike. There's, there's another uh, point to this. Um, like Mike was quite right. Why should the media get it as opposed to doctors and nurses or these things? But I think the answer to that is democracy. Um, you know, my own view is that the media is the cornerstone of democracy. It's the thing that keeps everybody honest. Um, it, it keeps a healthy society. And if we look what's happening in the US, we can see what happens when the society goes unhealthy, I think, um, because the media um, has, has got itself in a quagmire. So I think that's the answer. We need, but I take your point, we need to convince everyone out there. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, Jeff. Jeff uh, I was going to address this question and point out that the UK government this week, uh, not particularly enlightened government, is about to introduce a 2% tax on Google and the likes. So, what I think is quite important is to start moving towards getting to get a shared interest, people with a vested interest, to put pressure on the government, to not be quite so timid to follow suit with other governments are doing around the world. And it shouldn't be a big task. Well, I think they are putting it on the agenda. Robert Robertson's said that we'll look at it. Yeah, but more than look at that, you know, BPM and um, the interest group to just be, you know, now very much active in pushing this. So we know. And that follows on the idea of having a national conversation around these issues, which I think more than my Okay, sorry, there was a question at the back and then George. Yeah, um, I have a couple of my questions. I mean, the book speakers have found. But I just want to pick up a point that Michael Stiesky has made. I think what he's saying is you've got to take the public with you. You can't have some elitist argument, otherwise, the government won't feel like they've got any sort of mandate to do it. So, one of the things I would like to explore is going back to days of the 60s and 70s, the days of the old Lizzie but also the BBC, where they had um, some sort of a um, requirement to inform, educate, and entertain. Those first two words seem to have largely disappeared. It's all about entertain. Even the news out, some people seem to think it's a joke, you know, about pulling butterflies off, the uh, wings off butterflies. In interviewing politicians rather than getting to real facts and facts. Um, so I'm not too sure what well, the current requirement is, but surely all broadcasters, being in receipt of a license to occupy part of the broadcast spectrum, um, there should be a requirement for them to provide at least a proportion of informative and educational programs, not just go for the lowest common denominator, um, you know, endless cookery shows, etc., etc. Um, so, although that's not strictly about creating one um, public interest broadcaster, it's about changing the environment of broadcasting. Uh, I think at the moment people see the gobble box as just something to kill time and use when they need to chew out. Uh, well, I think I think what you were alluding to is is the case of the of the UK, where actually all the all the other free-to-air commercial broadcasters do have some minimum obligations to provide uh, basic public service requirements, including local news and certain types of programming. 
uh, which they're desperately trying to get out of for commercial purposes. Um, so so uh, I don't know, would anyone from the panel care to respond to that? Would that be a viable option for well, New Zealand? I, I think it would be if, if that's the cost of getting some share of the funding. I think it's reasonable for the government to say, we're going to give you some money that you need to commit to news, current affairs, um, information type programming. Yeah, I don't think there's a free lunch, so I agree. And, and those are values that are enshrined in RNZ, so it's hardly a, it's not a challenge of doing anything in particular. But if I go back to kind of the current economic viability of commercially owned media, if you're going to, I mean, if we impose another cost on top of what's frankly a perilous um, commercial media environment, you know, what, you know, what is, does that, what does that, uh, what does that mean, frankly, to the businesses? I don't think it addresses the, fun, the underlying issues or problems. Um, that are challenging the commercial media. And for public media, it's the end. Yeah. Well, I think Finland is the prime example today. <coughs> the similar situation, a small population, and the same problems that we've got. And they've uh, successfully maintained a public service, single independent public service channel through introducing a marginal tax rate uh, successfully. I think it's a, it's a great example for New Zealand to follow myself. So what's the, who's, who's taxed with the marginal tax rate? <coughs> In Finland? Sorry? Where does the tax, marginal tax rate apply to what entities? I can't remember exactly how the tax rate works, but it was, accept, it was acceptable to the public. Um, that was the big thing about it. Everybody accepted that as a good idea. And so it wasn't a problem to get it introduced, to get that tax rate introduced. I was just um, going to say, yeah, so those refeed principles, um, that's sort of what Exit On Air is founded on as well, this kind of the public media. So the idea that this is a contestable fund for non-commercial and commercial media outlets in New Zealand um, to access those funds, they need to they dis display a, a high quality of public media and content that they want NZ On Air funding for. And the way that allowing that to be funded through NZ On Air means that, um, you know, it's it's content where different audiences are accessing their content. So for audiences who maybe don't use TVNZ or RNZ, they're still able to, and thinking younger New Zealanders here, they're still able to access that content on, um, say, the spin-off or vice, you know, and that's it's content that's found in those principles also. I've just, I've just come back from Australia, watching the ABC coverage of the Wentworth by-election. Um, and of course, there's a hostile government to the ABC in, in power in Canberra at the moment. So what kind of arguments do they advance? Well, of course they advance those public sphere arguments. But there's another thing as well, and that's it's localism and infrastructure. I mean social infrastructure. You know, these, these kinds of public media initiatives around ABC, and that includes radio and television, you know, it's about the core of communities. It's about communities being able to talk to each other. It's like it's, if you took that out, there'd be a huge some kind of gap in, in civic society and political culture as well. And I think that's, in terms of getting across to middle New Zealand, I think it's, it's that sense of having ownership over, over, over a social infrastructure, as I think is probably, probably the, one of the most powerful arguments you can, you can use. Okay. Thanks, man. So a question from George and then a question at the back. I do want to start with a question, and I think it is, whether we are sufficiently questioning the circumstances we found ourselves in. I don't know whether you noticed in the New Zealand On Air newsletter a couple of months ago, there was an acknowledgement of a man called John Stevens. Uh, and he's interesting in this context, Michael, because he wasn't a broadcaster, he, he was a regulator. And in the years when we were uh, setting up TV3, there suddenly became a complete change in the funding paradigm. It followed after a complete, a comprehensive uh, review of broadcasting structures in New Zealand. Uh, Alan will remember that a lot of British broadcasters came out, but they, the prime objective for broadcasters was to divide a system that would work for New Zealand. Now the surprise we got, and this is when the third channel hearings were happening, out of the blue came this, this new funding model that there would be all public money would go to a single funding agency. It was called the New Zealand Broadcasting Commission. And with little consultation, very little discussion, this model was thrust upon us. It's been copied nowhere else on earth. And Mr. Stevenson's passing was noted only by New Zealand on air. 
He's, he, 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 he's not recognised as a key contributor to New Zealand broadcasting, yet he affected, and that, that Labour government at the time accepted, this complete change, where the public money would be dispensed on a contestable basis with no editorial authority. And one of Alan's good points, you made a lot of good ones there, Alan, was that the broadcasters in most uh, democracies have an editorial control. And the fatal flaw with New Zealand on air, not much addressed, and it's not much to address, because New Zealand on air for these 30 years have been handing out the money. And the, and the key fundamental concept as to whether they should, they should dispense to a myriad of eyeballs and ears, money here, money there, money there. And what, what, I'll come quickly to the present again, we now have public money divested to this fragmented audience. There is no single place in New Zealand when you can go and watch or listen, with the exception of Radio New Zealand, when in crisis or important matters you can turn to in confidence that time will be set aside for this, that the archives will be kept, that there will be a variety of New Zealand programs shown in prime time, and that there is a single agency or agencies whose purpose is secure and funded, whose job it is to, to in whatever medium, be it online or whichever variety of web um, applications there are, you can turn to with certainty. Where do you go now in New Zealand for a single place to find out what's going on? The eyeballs are the thing. There's this proliferation of outputs. And the, the idea of a single New Zealand broadcaster, which belongs to us all, and has this job in this tiny, remote, distant country of holding firm on our media and our culture, for us, has gone. Has gone. And this review doesn't consider that whether we do, in fact, have Mr. Stevenson's model. Is that the best answer? Why has it not been copied? for 40 years. If this is the most important thing, David, that we have in New Zealand, why has no one else picked it up? It's just the best in New Zealand. Well, it's, it, it, and I haven't been exploring um, all the different taxes and ways that we can do this, but I, I return to Alan's point that a, a broadcasting system for this people, where people who care about it and whose job is not looking about the bottom line, or, or trying to work some kind of deal, but whose purpose and passion and, and, and uh, community is, is for this purpose. As far as I know, the BBC, old auntie BBC, still manages to deliver a variety of outputs, an all media, an all media. And they're a much bigger country, and they, they do web, they do, it's easy to find, they do sound. You can find in one secure place in the United Kingdom a comprehensive and up-to-date, contemporary, forward-looking thing. We s somehow, and such as, and I pay credit to your, to New Zealand on air, and they've, they've parlayed their model well. Uh, they have great interest in doing so, because it's provided uh, a career and, and, uh, and they a single, consistent voice throughout. But I just invite you, my question is, at this, at this crucial time, can we please include the wisdom and relevance of that model today? And when we have such a scattered sources, competing media, overseas influence, cannot we not please consider, and I don't think this would be such a huge radical step, we have the assets, we have the assets, I'm not trying to advise you on how exactly you do the distribution, but I want to hold fast to, to that idea of a New Zealand broadcasting service, we're smart. Look what, look what we're able to do. This is something entirely within our capacity and ability to do. So my question is, can we please include, at this critical time, a consideration of whether we might return to Mr. Stevenson's single idea and revisit it and ask ourselves, is there not a better way of, of pulling together the resources, of which we don't have enough, to do a bigger job? but which does not depend on this model, which revisits and maybe leaves for others to work out the commercial interests, the investment bankers, the pension funds who run TV3 and MediaWorks. Somehow we are waiting for them to make up their minds where there is, we have the wits and the means and the skill to take hold of it at this moment still. It's not radical. It's not radical to have a television, radio, broadcasting system funded for us, non-commercial, is it? Is that so very hard? We have the, we have the technology and we have the people.
and I've given you the quest. Okay. Thank you. Do, do, do any, any of our panel like to respond? Maybe Anna, since you're representing New Zealand on that. Um, yes, yeah, sure. Um, so, I don't, your point just about that, in terms of NZ On Air not having an editorial, um, you, was that a criticism? Like a criticism? I noticed you're changing with Radio New Zealand. Right, so no, NZ On, there's like a deliberate reason why New Zealand On Air doesn't have any sort of editorial control and it's to create a barrier between uh, the government and platform. So, but in terms of, well, and funder, but um, we will only commission content or fund content that has a um, free-to-air platform that is attached to the content creator and they perform a commissioning role. So they have the editorial. There's a deliberate reason why NZ On Air stays out of that. We're just committed by the Broadcasting Act. We go through that and that's how we assess applications, whether they adhere to public media principles. And then it's up to the platform and the content creator to make content for that particular platform's audience. It's not the best way. And it's slightly so, more the, complicated than that. Can I just well, yeah, add, add a little thing? Because, <laughs> you know, there was from another experience, question. I know it's more complicated than that. A program can have a platform commitment to um, screen it, um, but that's not sufficient for New Zealand on air funding. It actually has to have a letter of support to asking for New Zealand on air to fund it. So the it also needs money coming from the platform in most degree. Well, it does now, but Can still that doesn't it. happen in some other some content. Um, yeah, and third party funding can come. Yeah. But unless so the, the media platforms play a role not just in being new platforms which filmmakers can once they've got their platform access New Zealand on air's funding, the platforms actually play a determining role on how New Zealand on air spends its money. They have, so it could, it, you have, they, they decide which programs they want New Zealand on air to support, having said they'll show them on their platforms. So the example which I experienced is that a platform, you can, as an independent filmmaker, you can have a platform saying they'll show your film, but we don't want New Zealand on air to fund it. So that line is crossed by that, if I can call it rather bizarre and unfair, two tracks, the, the platform and the letter of commitment. I think there's, there's a, a, a question there about whether or not there's gatekeeping power um, bestowed upon the, the, the platform providers, the, the distributors. And it's the way because the unless they agree power. to show it, of course, you can't get the funding for the content. Now, there's an, interest, there's an interesting thing that happened recently, and maybe this will come up in the discussion, I won't talk about it at length, but the new joint investment fund, you know, kind of collaboration between RNZ and New Zealand and Air, where New Zealand and Air um, provides the funding on a contestable basis to the local production community. But that, that $6 million fund is earmarked uh, for distribution on RNZ. So that, I don't know if that's an interesting way forward because what you've effectively done is vertically integrated the funding body uh, you know, with, with, a, with a public broadcaster to make sure that you don't have a commercial gatekeeper going, nah, we don't want that public service stuff. Well, it works best because in that case the editorial decisions are made yeah. so okay. <laughs> by, by the broadcaster. Not and, and they decide how the money. Yep. I don't think you. No, we got, so, got several so questions. Sorry. Yep. No, no, I think I think this gentleman had a had a response. <laughs> yeah, um, I was very struck by uh, Mark's reporting of um, uh, Paul Thompson's comment that he would not expose uh, Radio New Zealand to the risks of linear TV. Uh, and uh, Mark talked about the, uh, um, Paul Thompson thinking that uh, linear TV was a very rough and pre rough precarious business. Now Claire Curran, for all her faults, had a very clear vision of a uh, of RNZ Plus, a standalone public television channel. But uh, it would seem at the moment there's a, a, a real backing away from that. And I wondered what the panel thought about whether that notion of RNZ Plus, a standalone public television channel, uh, is dead in the water. I can understand RNZ has other priorities at the moment, developing its new service, and its new service, in my view, is better than it's ever been. It's done some remarkably good investigative uh, reporting lately, the reporting of the Southern Cross, D Southern DHB's failure to do uh, 
prostate, uh, prostate cancer operations. It's reporting on steel and tubes, use of substandard, um, substandard steel. And just last Friday, uh, just before the ANCOP news, there was a, a very good piece of research on the record of Karl Grubczyk, the immigration, the man at the Centre of Immigration Scale, his, his criminal record, which I haven't seen anywhere else. It was a very good, concise uh, piece of research done in a very short time. RNZ is, uh, in radio is doing investigative reporting, which traditionally radio didn't do. Uh, but that's an aside. Does the panel think that the notion of RNZ plus as a standalone public television channel uh, is dead in the water? What is the panel thing? Well, what, is, it is, is that a good thing? Well, what Paul was talking to was linear television as we all know and understand it today. So what, uh, in part, um, RNZ was captured by a debate where people sought to define RNZ's interest in doing more in video and on television as being some kind of com competition to the commercial model. So big shiny floors, studios, $50 million building on the corner of Victoria and Hobson Street, that's not what RNZ has said that it would like to be tethered to or tied to. And, you know, Mark's talked to the, the declines in audiences, and I would concur with him around the speed of, of that decline and the, you know, the velocity of that decline as opposed to some of the research. Um, but it doesn't mean that RNZ doesn't have ambitions in the context of doing more uh, in, video, in the video form. I mean, we are already on television, Channel 50, Checkpoint goes out, we've got an hour and a half of TV a night already on Channel 50, on, free, on the Freeview platform, so we're actually already there. So but you need to think about it in that context as an expansion. But why would you want to split your resources? What? Why would you want, you've got two separate medias, why would you want to split your resources? Why wouldn't you concentrate on making radio the best in the world and not a middle? Well, I, I think, I, well we do want to make our radio the best in the world. But you but will never do that once you get tied into television. That's only if we adopt a traditional broadcast approach. Big shiny floors, great big studios. If you reflect, if, if you watch Checkpoint on television, you'll see that it's a radio studio with cameras in it. Right? Yeah, and, you won't and stop last, there. And you won't stop there. And last you'll, week... You'll start enlarging your, and making demands on your staff and your resources to enlarge the, the, commerce, the television output. But, but, but there, isn't, there isn't a newsroom in the country where journalists aren't expected to file across multiple, multiple media forms. That's, that is the sad and actual reality of today. Yeah. Can we uh, expect to see more the, programs like Checkpoint? Is that, the, is that what the, the $6 million is going to go towards with RNZ? No. Mm -hmm. no. The, the Innovation Fund is a contestable fund that's jointly managed by New Zealand On Air and RNZ. And what we've identified, and, and by and large, most of the content associated, overwhelmingly, the majority of the content associated with that also involves the participation of, of independent producers and or content makers. Um, Sounds like a very complicated system to me. Well, <laughs> how do people access it? Yeah. What, well, the access the fund? No, what, access the program. How well, well, the, the innovation fund was announced about three months ago. Um, the MOU was signed about a month after that. The first of the request for proposals, which was around a diverse media um, journalism fund, uh, went out about a month and a half ago. They're being assessed now. There'll be two more RFPs that'll go out before Christmas this year. One will be for growth audiences, so that'll target uh, regional, youth, Māori and Pacifica, and a signature series, so something in the mould of Rua Pika Pika, which you might be familiar with, that RNZ did last year. But it's not about turning on a tap. This stuff ain't going to show up. What I mean, how audiences access the content? Oh, yeah, yeah. Pri well, the primary, pla the primary platforms will be RNZ's platforms. The website? Right? Yeah, correct. Application, our uh, Channel 50, our radio network. Uh, we, uh, in fact, we've had some fantastic advances around smart speakers. There's, there's a whole raft of podcasting. There's a whole raft of assets, that, distribution assets, that RNZ has. But first and foremost, it's about service, serving the audience that we've identified that we want to support and serve. Then it's about the content that we would make that meets that brief, and then we talk about distribution. Some of those things over time will own, others will share. The conference that Mark referred to, that Paul attended, I mean the subject of his speech was radical sharing. So this is not, this is, this is uh, the 
the innovation fund, but act, frankly beyond the innovation fund, into our day-to-day -day news and current affairs reporting. I mean, there's strong evidence of us working with small and large media entities, large commercial, and very small private, family-run uh, media organisations around the country. So, you know. So do you think innovation so, fund content will be shared? Can I just answer Barry's question? Yeah. I don't, you know, Barry asked the question, is RNZ plus as a linear channel dead in the water, more or less, or what's the status with it? The view is it was dead before it even began, essentially. The $6 million for a linear TV channel or whatever it was, was just nuts, and this is, this is why Claire's thinking hasn't been... Um, you know, well, she thought she had 38. Well, well, yeah, well, kind of well received. So, I think, but I think what this point Stevens making is that they've always seen it as a multimedia addition um, to RNZ and he's right, every newsroom has to be in the video game whether they like it or not and I think RNZ is going to try and do it in the most cost effective way that it, that it can vary um, but yeah, it's never going to be a linear channel like TV1 or um, TV3 that's and I'd just like to say that a great thing about the Joint Innovation Fund is that it does champion independent producers, especially for the diverse journalism I've just seen, and that is an important part of um, you know, sustaining the industry. We've got to remember that there are independent producers who are creating content for platforms, and that's absolutely what NZ On Air wants to see. And yeah, if it creates more content like Rua Pekka Pekka, I feel like that was a bit of um, a flagship for RNZ, and sort of a, this is what RNZ is capable for um, in terms of or, like AV content or video content, and so that's probably the path it's going to take. So I had a question at the back and then another question over here. Okay, that's, I, I wanted to just pick up on something that Mark said about half an hour ago, using the word democracy. Um, because a lot of what you're talking about is a brokering system and a distribution model that's passed its use by date. Um, you can't tax audience behaviour, so you can't tax Google and Facebook and expect the audience is going to come back to you. What you need to do is actually revalue the audience and revalue the system. You've got a, a title called Better Public Media. All I've heard is commercial profit-driven media all the way through this conversation. Has anybody actually got any ideas about public media and how to make public media exist in this country? Because it currently doesn't. I mean, have you thought about setting a public trust for TVNZ so that it's not a commercial model? So that it is actually being revalued as social capital for the country? Anybody want to respond? Well, the trouble, the trouble is that to, if you wanted to take TV1 non-commercial, you've got to find $250 million straight away. And it goes to Michael's point. Where's that coming from? So, sorry, Michael, could, I, hold it. Could, I, could you repeat that again? Sorry. You... So, if you want to take TV1 yeah. non-commercial, it will cost you $250 million. Why is that? The cost of, if you take out the, the lost advertising, that's the first thing. Yeah. I think that's um, 180 million. Uh, about 80. Okay. Well, what make TV2. What about making TV2 non commercial? TV2 is small. No, not, not too small to start. I'm no, he's talking, no, about, right. talking about how to make TV1 non commercial. Well, that's well, it would bring. Start with TV2. Make TV2 non commercial. <laughs> small, as you say. And you've got to start small. There's no way you can start with us. Under the arts, culture, and heritage remit rather than broadcasting. Because clearly it has an arts and cultural and heritage benefit to this country. So you're, you've got several options available to you. All you're really talking about at the moment is a private profit driven model. I guess rather than ask TVNZ to be something that it is completely not, right? The, the, the idea of the separation of channels, I've lived through this before. There, it's, there isn't a TV1 team and a TV2 team. All the back-end services support to the, the TV1 and TV2 sit as two consumer-facing channels. The back-end supports uh, both of those channels. It's a commercial organisation. Yes, it's having its troubles, but, but, why, but why not let it continue to be a commercial organisation in whatever shape that might be? Don't ask it. I mean, it's, it seems very difficult to me to see how you would get achieve that kind of both commercial and cultural shift. You've already got a public media organisation. 
why not expand its remit? Why not expand its resources? Well, that's great if you could do it, yeah. <laughs> why would it be hard to um, make TVZ non-commercial part of it? Because really it's just about changing the remit and you shut down the sales and marketing department and you just change their focus for the organisation. Where does the money come from to cheaper the life? Apart from that, yes, that's a big thing. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, but it's also not just the sales organisation. It has one finance department, one HR. If you're going to split these things up, you're going to start to duplicate cost into two separate Oh, it's going to be more expensive. You don't need to separate those things. You should keep using it while it generates recently. One day it will not be able to have advertising because the world is killing off commercial TV. So whilst it's still yeah, alive, you should all enjoy it. Don't actually change that before it happens. Why wait to go up the cliff? Why not actually? See, I, my, I, I'm really festival. I actually have audiences growing year on year. You guys are all having your audiences depleted. So my model is about cultural experiences, open access cultural experiences through photography in this region. My audience is growing. Yours isn't. I run a charitable trust, so you know. The model's wrong. Well, I think that's part of the debate that we're having. <laughs> I don't think there's any one solution we all agree on. Sorry, question at the back. Hello, Koto. Uh, my name is Matty Wall, and I'm not a broadcaster, but I am a concerned citizen. Um, thank you to all the participants and the speakers, and particular thanks to Michael Stiasny um, for his comment. And I hope, I, to me, um, it was bound to the soul because my concern about media in New Zealand is about the fact that people now don't seem to understand, particularly younger people, those of us who are not here, who are grey-haired and who take it as a given that public media is important and that um, news and current affairs is the uh, um, absolutely necessary for democracy. That is not a given outside the walls of this building. And what Michael has said is critical. It's more important than the how. And when I come to these discussions, idiotic and ignorant that I am, I hear people talking about the this and the that and we could do this and we could that. I don't give a rat's ass. I don't care. I know I should, but I know that you people understand those things. I don't. But I care very much about this country. And I care mightily that for probably 20 years, if not a generation now, there is a whole bunch of people in positions of power, positions of growing power because of their age and their demographic, who know nothing about the world that I grew up in and was, or, or in which I was informed regularly by media about the world that I live in. And you only have to think about, and I have got a question at the end of this, and I will make it short. I'm not going to rave, rave on because too much longer. But you think about the top party last year and about Gareth Morgan's valiant effort to engage people in policy. And then, of course, he said in the end, when he didn't get where he wanted to get, oh, well, New Zealand is a fat and complacent and they don't care about policy. Why should they? Where do they understand policy? How do they understand policy? And policy is not necessarily going to come out of investigative journalism, nor is it going to come out of news, but it will come out of good current affairs. We've got the platforms. What we don't have is the philosophy. So my question, sorry that I've got round to it so long-windedly, but my question, which I don't expect an answer to now from the Better Public Media Trust is, will you hear what Michael Stiasny has said? And will you please not focus on the how, but focus on the why, why it matters. Because that is the challenge for us and those of us who care about, is to convince to the generation below who don't know about why it matters and tell them and make a case, an absolutely indelible case about why it matters for the health of this country. Thank you. Well, I'm aware that we're running out of time. Some of our illustrious speakers have flights to catch, so maybe we have time for one more question. I don't really have a question, but I'd like to put up on the spot. We have got some younger members of the audience here. I think they should have opportunity to say something. Would you, would you like to comment? Yes.
I don't know. I think what you said about the age discrepancy is really important, and I feel like no one else here, I guess, aside from you, because you're like a completely different, like different department kind of thing, has really taken that into account. Like young people don't really care about TV, and like, yeah, why should we care about TV? Um, we might be like the last generation that really grew up with TV, and people younger than like than us. Like, yeah, they're not always have TVs now. Yeah, like we don't have TVs. Like, you know, it's 55% like of the population, millennials or younger, and 15% of the population are over 50. Mm -hmm. The majority of people in this room mm -hmm. are an exceedingly small minority. So how do you equate that with the research that New Zealand On Air did, which shows such a large number of watching linear TV? I don't. Because, I mean, Mark, you question that. You don't believe it? No, I don't. I know my yeah. own patterns, I know my own children's patterns. Um, I know all my peers and colleagues, we don't watch free to air TV. Yeah. Take, to, take Maori TV, best example in the world. It's meant to be around, sorry, I think ignorantly, to um, foster to rail. Its population market, its target market is 15 to 30, give or take. We know that those people don't watch linear TV. What's Maori TV? It's a linear TV. It's crazy. It's a waste of 50 million bucks. It's got an on-demand platform. Yeah. Sorry? It's got an on-demand platform. Oh. And they're on Facebook. Okay. Yeah. I think that's why the discussion of linear TV, it comes down to the brand. Like the brand needs to be malleable and be able to move online because that is absolutely where the audience is. As the audience gets older, as we age in New Zealand, uh, it's going to be towards online, it's not towards linear. So it needs to be adaptable. TVNZ's well, TV online yes. offerings have become amazingly over the last 20 years. Yeah, they're on demand services. Yeah, but the, the, the thing is that they've, they've, that research was done. They went and asked ordinary people. Now, they didn't go to the urban elites, which is how you could class some of the people in this room, much of the people in this room. And, and, they, and they actually went and quantitatively asked people how they get their media. Now, who are we to say that's wrong? Do we know better? Because of the people we know, or is that is that research bunk? What's happening is the television system is evolving. So the question we should ask is, what will television look like? And clearly, it's going to be less linear. We know that, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that television as a medium is going to, you know, spectacularly decline. It just means that our modes of reception and the technologies of distribution are going to change. Yeah. What do you mean by linear TV? Oh, TV1, TV3. Episodic. We need to watch the linear schedule. Live television with a schedule. So if you have a TV and you're tuning in to watch TV1 live or TV2, as opposed to TVNZ on demand where you're watching. It seems to be an academic term. No, it's not. I don't understand. Everything online is narrow casting. It's not actually broadcasting. No. Well, it's not broadcasting. It's not broadcasting. It's not broadcasting. It's not broadcasting. So, well, look, I think, I think we've reached the point where we're going to have to close. So, uh, a very, very big thank you to all our, uh, all our speakers for taking the time to, uh, to come and uh, inform the debate. So, let's show our appreciation. Thank you very much.